9 million acres of forest, 1,700 miles of continuous shoreline, 4,300 lakes, 12,000 miles of streams, more than 300 waterfalls, 15 counties, two time zones, and one area code. Welcome to the Upper Peninsula. Welcome to 906 Outdoors. This beautiful handmade birch bark canoe is destined for the water. But to fully appreciate the experience, we first need to witness how those who built it, along with the forest and the river, all came together to create this amazing piece of functional art. Before we look at the how, we need to look at who. Meet John and Victoria Youngworth. I hesitate to use the generalized and in recent years cheapened term off the grid, which refers to living in a self-sufficient manner without reliance on one or more public utilities. While that is certainly true, it by no means even begins to give you a taste of the lifestyle that John and Victoria have chosen. Ever since I can remember, that's all I've ever wanted to do was to live in the middle of the woods, far from everything. I even wanted to just be able to canoe in to a place and just live like that, maybe three portages in or a day's travel or something like that. I, I did have that. And that's, that was my chosen career probably since I was eight years old or something. The journey here begins on a remote blacktop road, which soon turns to gravel, and then to a two-rut road. The final stretch is on foot to the remote and very, very quiet cabin in the high country of the Upper Peninsula. Um, I definitely over the years feel like I, um, without even knowing, I was developing the skills that it takes to live like this. So. Um, maybe without even, uh, uh, without an idea that at the end of it we'd end up here, I was, all, I, I was automatically picking up the skills that it took to, um, to live like this. And then we came here slowly, picking up more of those skills along the way, so that by the time we actually moved here, we could you know, live comfortably and, and build a house and raise the children and do all that, do all that, that it takes to, yeah. to live this lifestyle. There was a brief time in high school when I thought I was going to do like a regular career, like a job, job, but I bailed on that as soon as I got smart again. <laughs> and so the day after I got out of high school, I jumped in the car with a canoe on top with my buddy, and we went up to Hudson Bay in the canoe and started exploring Canada. And every summer after that, we would explore Canada. It was important to me that the lifestyle that we chose is one that we could keep doing forever, um, and that actually everyone in the world could do too. If the world was organized differently. John and Victoria build canoes the traditional way, the way their Ojibwe Indian predecessors did in this same region many years ago. I started a birch bark canoe when I was 18 after I left home. And I started carving to pieces and, and after I made my first piece I realized I had a long way to go so I gave up on that and went out and bought a plastic canoe. But I always had that in the back of my mind that I, I, was, I would like to have the skills to build a canoe. So what does it take to build a birch bark canoe? Not just build one, but do it without all of the conventional conveniences offered by more connected locations. We're about to find out. This is the boat that we'll be building. This one's about, I don't know, 15 years old and this is our old beater. We wanna see how they die so we don't be that nice to it. We just keep using it. This piece of bark here will turn into this boat here, this is the same boat that we're building because we use the same form for it. So you need a piece at least 10 feet long, four foot wide to be nice, but how do you find a tree that big? Gotta be thick barks. Maybe one in a thousand trees has the kind of bark that you need for that kind of stuff. There's only a few weeks a year that it peels off nice and you have to weight it down because the bark wants to curl up into a big tube. So we unrolled that the other day with a bunch of hot water because you store it in big rolls. That's probably 10 years old. Keeps good. I mean, for us, it's like money in the bank. You can get it on a logging site before they log it. All we want is the skin of the tree. You need a ton of hot water to, to bend the bark, to make it pliable, because it stiffens up when it gets cold. 
but when you warm it up, it gets, like I say, it gets like belt leather. This is the building form. This is our only permanent piece of equipment. And that's like the basic floor of the boat. So this is for a 14 and a half foot canoe. Eastern Lake Superior, Western Lake Superior, they're kind of two distinct types because there's more uh, wild rice on the west end. So you can tell if a boat is from rice country because it'll have the long nose, which is very useful for parting the rice when you're going through the paddies. And they tend to not have a center thwart, so you can bend the, the stalks inside to beat them. But this model here is particular. It's from, uh, was recorded in Sault Ste. Marie, probably in the middle of the 1800s or something like that. And this is uh, what would be called a work boat back in the day, which working back in those days would have been hunting and fishing for a living. You can fit two people in it and you can put some gear in it, but it's still small enough to solo. So they called this a work boat. Or when uh, Europeans showed up, then it would be called a hunter's canoe. The signature of a boat is the end piece here. The shape of the end is, that kind of tells you what band of uh, people that it came from. So when the boat comes around the corner on the river, you can see the profile of the end of the boat. And then you can, you know, whether you need to put the kettle on or you should get the shotgun out. Nine Hundred Six Outdoors is brought to you by Race Driven, your source for Premier Power Sports products. This system is designed to be done by nomads, semi-nomadic people. So that's why you build them on the ground. In the old days, the people would have just knocked them out really fast because this would have been the F-150 pickup of the day. So the building frame defines the floor, the bottom of the boat, and the length of it and stuff. The gunwale assembly, that stays in the boat. This is the inwale, just where it's in the stems. That's all stitched together with the basswood bark. And then you have these little pegs here. This tells you how deep the boat will be. So each one of these spots has a little peg that sets the height of the gunwale, the inwale. And so the only permanent parts, the building form and a set of those pegs with the marks on it, that gives you all the dimensions you need to know. So you see, you always put the marks on there so you know where each of the pegs go. And that way you can come up with basically the same boat every time you build it again. And then the rest of it's pretty much done by eye and measurements off your hand or a stick or, or something like that. It's all done by eye. There's nothing, there's not a straight line in a boat like this. So we set this up, we pound all the stakes in the ground so the holes will be there at the proper angles and everything. There's a straight string on the bottom that will help us line the bark up. Then we're going to pull all this apart. It's all cedar split out of a tree trunk. You have to find the perfect cedar to split a 20 foot two by two. And the only danger is when you pound the stakes back in, there's usually a toad in every one of these holes. Pull it. Well, a tree like this is probably 75 years old or so, maybe a hundred. Every year it adds on another tissue thin uh, layer of the of bark like this, which is stretchy. Because as the tree gets bigger, the outer layers have to keep stretching. That's why it peels off like that. And so you need something that's at least an eighth of an inch thick, if not better. Because the bark's waterproof, but the tree can breathe through these little slits here. You can't have ones that split up like that. It's like I say, it's one in a thousand or 10,000 trees that has all these qualities it can't delaminate. It has to be flexible. It's really hard to find a tree like that. So you look through a zillion trees to find one that has those qualities. Yeah, so after you, you take it off the tree and then roll it up in the sunshine and you can store it like this park we harvested maybe 10 years ago. Because now we gotta put 40 tons of rocks on here. We'll put the building frame back on top. We'll weight it down with a ton of rocks, hold the bark flat and tight. We're gonna put the gunnel assembly back on top. We'll be putting the stakes in, 
and then that'll there'll be batten strips to hold it in place because the bark's going to want to always curl up every time it gets dry. All of the characteristics you want a boat to have when it's finished, rocker is the curve of the bottom coming up and then rise at the ends is the ends tilting up so when you bump into a rock you're right up onto it. You have to decide all that ahead of time and plan ahead so that when you put the ribs in the boat that those qualities will show up. You have to think about all that now. Today's show is brought to you in part by Rapid River Knife Works, home of Michigan's largest custom knife factory showroom. I'm trying to get this big wiggly alligator skin to be in the shape of a boat. You don't get to know if you're successful till the very end. You still have to be thinking ahead. So just like uh, wrapping the paper around a globe, you have all those weird cuts and then they mold it onto a curved shape to get something two-dimensional to be formed over a three-dimensional object. So we got to make cuts along the side to get the bark to go round, <laughs> flat bark go around. So this is what we call cutting the gores. If the water burns your hands, it's too hot. So your gores only go down to the building frame. We don't like them go below that, or they'll rub on the rocks. Gotta soften her up. the Stone Age way of holding everything together. And this is where those pre-made holes all come into play. We'll have to do this probably a thousand more times <laughs> before we get there. You need a straight line from here to the building form. And if it's pooched out one way or another, then when you go to put the ribs in, your canoe's gonna be, it's gonna be out of shape right there. So you're trying to, we got two dimensional bark, and then do all these cuts, and then we're gonna be able to make a canoe that's all flat sides first, the sides and the bottom, and then stitch all that into place. And if you do all your homework and get all that done right, when you put the ribs in and stretch it all out, it'll be a nice fair round curve and it'll be perfect, which a bark canoe never is. <laughs> they're never perfect, but they're close enough and they work great in the water. So this is to try to get all of the parts to be committed to the three-dimensional boat made out of two-dimensional planes. So we'll do the same thing on this side, keep cutting the gores, raising it up, and then uh, be cutting it down so that because it's not wide enough to do the whole boat so we'll cut it down make a nice straight line all the way across and then fit another piece of bark in called a side panel and then uh, that's when uh, Victoria gets to do her 200 miles of stitching to connect all those bits of bark together so all the bark is one one big piece this is a root that's been dug out of the ground and um, we roll them up like this just to store them and then soak them so that they're soft and then you can unwrap them. And um, a lot of the canoe is held together with, these are spruce roots, and a lot of the canoe is held together with roots because there really aren't any other kind of fastenings. So all of these roots have to be split and peeled. I usually split them first because if they don't split properly, you haven't wasted a whole bunch of time trying to peel them. And the roots come in all different sizes. So uh, you need a selection of some of everything. There's usually a place that you can use just about anything. So then when it's split, 
gets peeled. So for a full-size canoe, we're going to need several hundred feet of this. We look for trees that are in fairly sandy spots because the sandier the soil is, the easier they are to pull out. We just um, pull a few roots from each tree. We don't take a whole lot from any tree, it doesn't damage the trees. But if you dig down and get a, a root, then you can pull it for yards. You can often get really, really long ones. Once the root is peeled and split, you have to sort of uh, work on it a little bit to flatten it out. Some of them are flatter than others, but um, the flatter the better, then they sit, you know, they sit nice on the boat and here's what they look like when they're done. When we need to use them, we soak them again um, and then they're ready to go. So this is the out whale, part of the gunnel assembly. Much smaller, doesn't add so much to the strength, but it makes the sandwich for the top of the bark to go in between. And then the stitching goes around that part of the three piece gunnel assembly. So you can see this is the sap wood. The sap gets split off and carved off. You really, you're just using heartwood. Sap wood isn't worth anything. It rots off, but the heartwood lasts for centuries with these old cedars, so you can find them laying around. That's what I look for. We got a bunch of big old cedars up in the hills here. Yeah, beautiful stuff. It's like plywood with perfect grain from end to end for 20 feet that you didn't have to glue together and clamp all by yourself. <laughs> Nine Hundred Six Outdoors is brought to you by Cooking Wild Seasonings. Make it fresh, make it yours. This is a nice tool because it allows me to use two hands to do the cutting, and that's my legs do the holding. Instead of just wearing out my one arm twice as fast, I can wear out both arms half as fast. I get twice as much work done before I got to stop. I inherited this draw knife from my grandpa's shop, which is way cool. This is a shaven horse, Ein Schnitzelbank, for old German. It's a good pair of hands that you can use with your feet. And then you have all little different decks you can put on here depending on the kind of work you do. But these are not the tools of the nomad. The old ones, they grabbed these kinds of tools and technology the day after they were available. If you're on the move and you got a semi-nomadic life, then back to the one arm. One arm's a does the blade and the other arm is the clamp. Find a nice big old dead cedar and pop that in half. And if you're lucky, half of that will still be good. You want straight green, no twist, real fussy, straight end to end. I like to be able to split a 20 foot two by two out of such a trunk. And then that's the tusk of the elephant that you carry home. If you don't have real good wood, then you can't split it, which means you got to put it through a machine, which means you're not a woodwright anymore. Now, I like splitting wood, man. It's, it keeps this so challenging. And of course, you have to follow the grain. If you go the wrong way, you'll tear the whole thing into two, and then you got to go get another one. And when you're using elephant tusks for your building materials, there aren't that many around, so you got to be smart and nice to them. So I'm doing this all one way, and then I'm going to turn around and have to pull because the grain changes throughout the stick. So you, you can only cut in with, with blades like this. You can only go one way. The grain has to, uh, you can't dig into the end of the grain or the, the blade's just going to go submarine and, and cut the thing in two. If you have a machine, machines don't care about grain. That's why you can't hardly bend a piece of wood that came out of a machine planer. You can see the grain there starts to go up. So if you dig in this way, it's just going to go down in. You have to turn around or you can turn the blade around, but you don't really get much power and control doing it like that. 
The ends of this will be split probably into four splits, probably a foot and a half up. And then at the very end, those get boiling water and they'll be bent up into that beautiful curve. Part of the signature of the maker, of the band, of people who manufactured it. So last time we had this bottom piece, which is uh, one piece of bark in place. And now we've added, this is called a side panel, and um, we've added this and stitched it in with this line of stitching here, uh, which is called saddle stitch. It has to be strong enough that when the ribs get pushed in under tension and this gets really, really pressed out, this is the only thing that holds it together. So this is a double stitch. I've got two roots, one on each side, and it's going to be covered in pitch. So none of this stitching is visible once we're done, uh, but it is a very, very important part of the process. The roots need to stay moist or they have a tendency to, they'll break. So I have to keep wetting them and fiddling with them. Okay, so these are the roots that we've peeled and split. This is basically what holds everything together. And the idea is to get it as tight as you can. Four pairs for each one, but depends on the root. Some roots are wider than others and it's more about just filling the filling the space. Once these are clamped together, it's a done deal. If your boat's good or bad, it, you won't know until the end, but it's a done deal for the, the shape of the boat now. So we have a little thin out whale, a big in whale, two layers of bark inside. And, the, and then also there's the reinforcing strip you see on the outside. And that's so that the stitching goes through two layers of bark. So when you put the ribs in, everything is going to stretch really big. So you want to have two layers of bark for the holes to go through so that it doesn't the stitching doesn't pull out of the bark nice little stone age trick and that's where the decorations go on too once that gets trimmed up and probably do a little paint job on there and in between the stitching is where the rib heads fit up in the little groove that was carved in the in whale in the back side it's like a continuous bevel and then you have to figure there's 10 ribs in between each of the thwarts and then five on the ends there thanks for watching be sure to check back next week for part two of our Birch Bark Canoe Project.